Good evening. Welcome to Emmanuel Assembly of God. My name is Pastor Ken. This evening we're going to continue our Bible study on the book of Chronicles. We're in 1 Chronicles chapter 20. So if you want to see the notes for today's lesson, click on the tab in the lower left hand corner where it says notes. A window will open up. Uh, you can follow along there. Or if you would like to print them off, right click with your mouse and save them as a PDF, print them off, and you can follow right along with us. So let's get ready, get your lesson, get your uh, Bible open to First Chronicles 20, uh, get your pen, maybe get a drink of water, and let's get started. Now remember, when we're talking about the book of Chronicles, the chapters are not in chronological order. Now, you would think from the word chronicles, uh, we would probably be uh, in logical, chronological order, but they are not. And sometimes we have an event that is uh, that's talked about, and then later in another chapter, we'll have it explained. And that is sort of what is happening uh, in chapter 20, uh, this uh, week. And so let's get started. Uh, verse number one, it says in question number one, at the time kings go out to war. Now, during the winter months, wars were not normally fought. Now, when we're talking about winter in that part of the world, uh, and maybe from where you are, uh, winter is not like it is where I am. Uh, here, in the winter, we get lots of snow, rain, freezing weather. Uh, you can see where that would not be a great time to fight a battle. Uh, in the same time with them, winter months, uh, rain and cold made travel difficult and campaigning uh, difficult. Uh, so there was a time when they went out to war and a time when they didn't go out to war. And so fighting would resume uh, in the spring. It's almost like they, okay, we'll come back in the spring. And so, and so they did. Now, David, Joab, and Abishai had not won a decisive uh, battle the year before. And so what, what happened uh, in previous chapter, uh, you hear, you see, we see the battle, we see uh, how that David stayed at home, and we see how that uh, Joab and Abishai divided their army, and uh, the Syrians and the Ammonites fled before them. And then the Syrians regrouped, and there was another battle. And so we're, we are today, we're explaining a little bit uh, this whole continued battle, but there was a break in the middle for the winter, and then it, and then it picked back up. And so uh, Joab went back out to drive the Syrians and the Ammonites uh, back home. And David at this time didn't go out. He stayed at home. He remained at home. Question number two, he remained at home in Jerusalem. Now, what happened when he remained uh, at home in Jerusalem? When the uh, author writes that he remained at home, uh, you and I might be going, we're waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? Uh, okay, so what happened? Well, it is so well known uh, that Chronicles, the author, did not feel the need to tell us. He just goes on and he skips uh, perhaps months uh, from one verse to the, the other. But in order for us to now. We are not looking at it from the perspective of those who would have been reading the book of First Chronicles when it was written. We are looking at it now as the Bible. We are also looking at it back as history. We're, we're looking back upon it. And what were some factors that were at play during that time period? Well, here's in between the lines that are necessary for you and I to get an understanding of what in Bible history and what was going on at that time. So David's at home in the palace. Joab and Abishai, they are out fighting 
uh, the Assyrians and the Ammonites. David, one night, he can't sleep. He gets up. He walks around the lattice, around the top of the uh, palace. And uh, on the other side, uh, down on another building, he sees a woman uh, bathing from his palace rooftop. Now, instead of turning aside, he acted on his impulses. Now, you remember that at this time, David had already married many wives. Uh, so this was not uh, out of necessity for him. Uh, but all of a sudden, his impulses, uh, he just let him take over. And uh, as a result, uh, sometime later, she told him she was pregnant. And her husband, Uriah, was out fighting for David. Uh, and now in in this, David thought, oh, what am I going to do? So David, he sent for uh, Uriah to come home, and he thought that Uriah will go home. He'll be here for a few days, and then he, you know, uh, he and his wife will be together, and then they can explain that the child is uh, Uriah's. Well, Uriah, he would not go home when his uh, fellow soldiers were fighting, and so that plan didn't work. And so what David did, uh, now, David David didn't kill, uh, and Joab didn't directly kill Uriah, uh, but they conspired against him. He had him stranded in battle. He told Joab to put Uriah in the hottest part of the battle, and then uh, for him to withdraw. Because you knew what happened when the, the army withdrew, then Uriah was stranded, and uh, the enemy uh, got the best of him. Whew. David thinks that he has dodged a bullet. Now, let's just learn a lesson here. We need to beware of moments and hours of ease. It is there we most easily fall into Satan's traps. So let's take a deep breath, recognize that the traps are going to come, and let's not put ourselves into a position of being trapped. If we do not fill up our time with productive endeavors, endeavors, others will fill them in. And the others don't have the same um, point of view and the same uh, commitment to the Lord that you do. And that often leads us into trouble. Jesus told us to watch and pray that we don't enter into temptation and yield to temptation. Uh, the temptation may jump out like it did with David. That David didn't do anything wrong when he saw this woman taking a bath. But the wrong piece happened afterward. You can't do anything about what you see, but you can do a lot with what you do afterwards. Now, as part of the uh, comparison to fill in the rest of the blanks in this, uh, Second Samuel, in question four, 2 Samuel 12, 29 tells us that David, uh, and this is the rest of the battle, gathered all the people together and went to Reba. And uh, now that would have been after the entire situation with Bathsheba. Okay, so that's all, all behind us. Uh, in other words, David went back to doing what he should have been doing in the first place. And uh, that was the final phase of David's restoration. There was chastisement for his sin. You know, there's always a price to pay when we mess up. But it did not mean that his life was ruined. It did not mean that his life was over. And that's the same way for you and I today. Oh yeah, there'll be, you know, there'll be penalties that we may have to pay and there'll be consequences, but our life is not over. There, there's life after we mess up. Now, in question number five, David took the magnificent crown from the Ammonite king's head. Uh, it tells us how huge this thing was. And he placed it on his own head. So what I want us to see in this lesson today, and uh, it's perhaps uh, what the writer here wants his readers to understand, because... It, Everybody knew David's sin with Bathsheba. You know, uh, 
he, they didn't need, he didn't need to bring that up. And so David's sin did not take away his crown. His life wasn't over. Now, at the end of the, uh, David thinks that he gets away with it. Uh, Nathan the prophet comes because the Lord told Nathan, and uh, he, he said, David, you're, you're guilty of this, and David repented. If David had refused the voice of Nathan, I'm the king, you can't tell me anything, uh, he would not have captured that crown to wear. Now, since Ammon had insulted David and hired the Syrians, their punishment reduced them to a provincial state. And uh, he, D David made them pay uh, tribute. In, in fact, great, David took a great spoil from them which provided for the temple eventually. You know, David could not build the temple, but he began to collect lots and lots of the materials that would be used in the building of the temple. Now, uh, in the defeat of the Philistines, verses 4 to 7, and again, chapter 19, we read some of the defeat that David uh, had over the Philistines. And now some of these stories, uh, they're, they are, there are stories within stories. Uh, just like in our history, uh, we, we, may, uh, we may know the, the details of something. Uh, for, for example, in the Revolutionary War, uh, there was uh, a general by the name of Benedict Arnold that was fighting for the revolutionary side, and uh, he he thought that uh, there could be a, something worked out, and then he became disillusioned when that didn't happen, and he went over to fight for the British, and so the uh, the term the name Benedict Arnold became uh, associated with. Uh, a, a someone who who becomes a traitor, uh, and so you, you don't have to go into the whole story. You just say, you know, that's a Benedict, and people understand uh, that. And that's what some of these stories inside of stories. Now, verse here it uh, chronicles the specifics of David's triumph over the Philistines. Uh, among the Philistines, there were great warriors. And uh, these warriors, some of them were giants, it, actually huge men. Uh, they and their sons were of great stature. Uh, they were also mighty warriors in battle. We remember, it's been a long time, but we remember the story of David killing Goliath and how huge Goliath was. And David was up against Goliath, this nine, ten feet tall man was huge. And uh, he had brothers, he, he had relatives, others in that area that were huge. Uh, these scriptures show that David could defeat giants. These scriptures shows how that Israel could defeat giants without David. David fought Goliath and he won, but the other men in his, on his side, they too fought giants and, and they killed them without David. Uh, now, Question seven is, here's the names of those who killed giants. Uh, Sebekai killed Sipai, son of the giant. And Elhanan killed Lami, the brother of Goliath. And then Jonathan, David's nephew, he killed the giant who had six fingers and toes on each foot and hand. He had 24 fingers and toes. Now, this isn't uh, unheard of. Uh, there are, uh, it's well documented. Uh, I, I, I didn't know them, but uh, a friend years ago knew someone who had this situation with six fingers and toes. Uh, and, and it happens every once in a while with people. But in uh, this case, that's what sets this man apart. Now, David's legacy was not only what he did, but what he left behind. And uh, maybe we need to hear that today. 
it sometimes it's not so much what we do as it's what we leave behind. David left behind a people prepared for victory. And you and I today, we need to leave behind our friends, our family, and prepare them for what is ahead. A parent is doing that for their children, aren't they? They are preparing them for their victory. Uh, you think of great men in history. Every one of those great men had parents who uh, raised them and had a powerful influence in their lives. And again, uh, we repeat this, the author bypasses some of the failures of David and David's children. Yes, everybody knows that David messed up. And yes, everybody knows that David's uh, children messed up. In very, verse 8 is the summary of these victories over the giants. These fell by the hand of David and his servants. And these victories made it easier for David's son, Solomon, to live in peace. Our present victories pass on something important to the next generation. So David stands as an example of perseverance. He did not allow his failures to ruin the rest of his life. So maybe someone you're listening today, maybe you need to hear this. Maybe, maybe you have something that uh, you're letting that keep you back. Uh, press on. God still has something uh, for you. Or maybe you think about something that you have messed up and just push on. The Lord is gracious and he will be with us. Now, question number nine. The writer skips a lot of known history between chapter 20 and 21. Now, those failures would not have been encouraging to those returning from Babylon. Many of them would have known the stories anyway, so he wasn't going to bring them up here. They needed a message of hope, not one of recounting well-known sins. Chapter 21 opens with the heading of Satan hindering Israel. Now, uh, this hindering came through David. And remember how David, well, he stayed home during the time of war. Uh, what was the feeling? Why Was he tired? Was he getting older? You know, what led him to that? And, and in here, uh, it says Satan hindered Israel, and the part of Satan hindering was the thought that came to David to number the children of Israel. <clears throat> it came through David, but Satan was still behind it. And for whatever reason, David orders a census of the people. Now, David knew he wasn't supposed to do this. Question number 10, generally, a census was for the benefit of the tabernacle. Each year, uh, those men over the age of 20 were supposed to redeem their life. So when a census was conducted, it was the priests who did it. <clears throat> At that time, each man was to pay a ransom for his life. And most of the time, it was a shekel, which in our time, uh, it was a piece of silver. And in our day today, that would be like the equivalent of a quarter. And uh, that was to represent how that the Lord, they were the Lord's because the Lord had redeemed them from Egypt. And so the Lord had them pay a ransom for their life. And this showed that the people were God's. It also enabled the priesthood to do the work that God commanded them to do, to minister to the people. And so they were, in essence, buying themselves back from God. Now, in ancient times, a man only had the right to count what belonged to him. You know, if he, if he had in his corral, if he had an ox that he was borrowing for a few days, he couldn't count that as his own. That belonged to someone else. So David had no right to count the people 
they were not his to count, but they belonged to the Lord. Now, the other part of this, they were not supposed to count on their numbers. You don't win a battle because of numbers. The Lord was with them. It didn't matter how many were with them. God was always going to take care of them if they walked in obedience to him. Now, Joab, question on 11. Joab tried to change David's mind because Joab knew that this wasn't going to end well. He knew this, this is not a good idea. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed. Oh, we are so surprised, aren't we? The, the, power, the one in power overruled. So Joab went throughout Israel and counted them. Uh, he brought back the report. Israel had 1,100,000 men who could fight, and Judah had 470,000 men who could fight. Now, notice here that Joab did not count the Levites and the Benjaminites, okay? In this respect, he did not actually count Israel, did he? he you know, there. There's something about, you know, he, he didn't lie. He counted Israel, but he didn't count Israel. You know, uh, he purposely left off. And in doing the census, he didn't count women and children. And he didn't count those that were the men that were too old to fight. And so in that sense, Joab, he sort of complied with what they, what the king wanted. But at the same time, he was trying to guard, you know, but God brought punishment against David for this census. David was taking it that he was trusting in his own might and not trusting in the Lord. So Nathan, he, he brought David a, uh, a choice. Uh, here's your punishment. Uh, a famine of three years. A defeat by your enemies and or a plague from the angel of the Lord. Now, David chose to be punished by the Lord. In this situation, David realized a punishment from the Lord. You're trusting the Lord's mercy. A famine is a famine is a famine. You, there's no changing the famine. It's, you know, yes, the Lord can send rain, but you, you've had that period of time, and then you're going to have to wait until the rains come and the crops return. And, and so three years, you know, that would be terrible. Uh, and a defeat by your enemy, who knows what an enemy will do. But suffering at the hand of the Lord, the Lord would, maybe the Lord would have mercy. And so David chose to be put into the hands and punished by the Lord. And we know that uh, the Lord did finally stop uh, the death angel and the plague was uh, stayed. Well, that's our lesson for this evening. Thank you for being with us and trust that the Lord will find something here to encourage your heart in him today. Uh, let's close in prayer. Lord, we pray for our friends today, Lord, that as they have been listening to this lesson and reading your word, we pray, Lord, that it will be a source of strength and help to them in their daily walk with you. Lord, when we mess up, Lord, we are not utterly forsaken. Lord, you have mercy upon us, and our lives are not ruined forever. So we pray, Lord, that your peace and your strength and your encouragement will be upon your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today, and we hope to see you real soon. You take care.